Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is a regularly scheduled, I'm sorry, this is a specially scheduled board, select board meeting in the town of Sunderland. We can call to order at 32. Two minutes behind. We don't quite, oh, we do have a full, we have, a, we have the, the whole thing. We've got everybody who could possibly be a Hollywood square. So that's a good thing. If there was more than that, we'd have to figure out a whole other game. Tonight we're going to talk about our, our minutes from April 13th. We're going to obviously update COVID-19 emergency update. Uh, we have our draft annual town meeting warrant uh, in front of us. There may be some additions to that warrant. Uh, we have motions in front of us, and we have to begin that as homework. That's important to bear in mm. mind. Select board updates, and then aggregation plan and timeline. I listened to an interesting uh, conversation on the Conway select board meeting uh, this past week about what's going on with Colonial. So that'll be interesting to see it as well. Okay, so first up, uh, minutes of April 13th, 2020, please. Make a motion on the minutes. Second. Motion. Minutes of 2000, I'm sorry, April 13th, 2020. Uh, would be nice to have one vote for all the minutes of 2020. That would be awesome. But anyway, April 13th, 2020. Motion is made and seconded. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 <clears throat> okay. Next up, let's go right into emergency updates. Caitlin, how's it going out there? How's the tracking happening? Oh, you're on mute, Caitlin. You're muted, Caitlin. Um, there we go. There you go. There you go. There you go. Um, it is happening, and uh, I wanted to make sure that I came to the meeting, um, and uh, it, uh, importantly, because we got a phone call in this week um, by someone who um, did not leave her name, and uh, actually, the caller, I didn't, didn't catch the number either. <laughs> So I had no way to contact her back and uh, she was unhappy be, and it actually, it, it wasn't our town. It was a case that originated out of um, at Hadley and she was a contact from Hadley and did not receive a call from our public health nurse. And she called and left a message uh, very upset about this and wanted to know why our town wasn't following proper procedures, et cetera. And so I'm hoping <laughs> that she and um, that she's listening or is availing herself of our, our meetings. Um, and uh, because I think it's important to let, uh, to, to have people know the procedures on the, um, contact tracing. So I thought this would be a really good time to do a, as a quick and dumbed down approach as I can <laughs> to contact tracing. Um, it is a very difficult and involved and in-depth procedure, but um, what happens is when a case comes in, um, the public health nurses in each town gets their case. Uh, it either comes in through, I'm, we've now anyone who's been following us knows we have this system called Maven, M-A-V-E-N, which is a state computer system, gets logged in um, and the public health nurse um, up for the town contacts the positive case. And it can either come in through Maven or it can come in through a doctor's referral. The public health nurse asks the positive case for their, con their direct contacts within the last, um, they have a formula, but they will say within a last certain amount of time, they will ask for their names, their addresses and their phone numbers. First of all, you can't turn somebody upside down and shake them and get all their contacts. They have to cooperate. 
A lot of people do. There are some people who feel that this is a personal invasion, um, that it's the government with, in quotes, capital T, capital G, <laughs> trying to get in their business. So it's a delicate operation. Um, it's a delicate questioning. And so not everybody cooperates and not everybody shares. But there are a lot of people who do, which is wonderful. Then taking that information, the public health nurse then contacts every person in their town. When the person is outside of the town, the public health nurse is supposed to call, either call the public health nurse of the other town. And in our case, we'll just take this Hadley case, the Hadley public health nurse never called Sunderland to tell Sunderland that we had a contact in our town. <clears throat> the other thing that happens is you put those contacts into the MAVEN system, the state system, so that another town can find out that there's a contact in another town. Unfortunately, our state system was never set up for this. Our state system is a closed system to protect privacy, which is one more wonderful thing. So not only do you put the contact of the next town into the MAVEN system, but then you have to do an extra step of sharing your case with the public health official of each town. And that may or may not get done. So unless the next town knows that there's a contact coming to them, we're not gonna know to make the phone calls. And so that's what happened in this one particular case with Sunderland. Um, and she didn't leave her name and number for us. So we don't even know. And we can't even call Hadley because we don't, I mean, we could probably, because we have small towns and I'll have her work on that. But if it's a large town with hundreds of cases, I mean, they would have no clue if we just called a public health nurse and said, hey, I got a phone call to Board of Health. Can you help me? That would be a disaster. Um, so this is why um, when we say that contact tracing is a slow and difficult, um, a slow and difficult process, that's what it, that this is what it entails. We are very fortunate to have just a handful of cases, literally now working, actively working. I think she's got three, we, Sunderland has about three um, that are outside of the 14 day cases. Um, I would, I also wanted to um, let people know, uh, the public who's listening, what type of questions I asked her, what kind of questions do you ask? And she said, um, she would uh, ask, ask them if they had symptoms and um, if uh, the, they had symptoms, she would um, tell them to isolate for 14 days. She would also obviously tell them to call their uh, primary care physician. Um, Self-quarantine if there's no symptoms. If they had to go out and get a uh, food or something, obviously use the mask um, or ask someone else to do it for them. Um, she would ask the last day that they were exposed to that positive person. And then she would ask them for a list of persons that they had been in contact with since that, since the date they were exposed to that positive person. So you could see how the contact tracing goes out and out. Um, so that's where, that is how the contact tracing works. Because of our town and the knock on wood, <laughs> um, low case, positive case that we have, we have one public health, health nurse working on it. Deerfield had high, has the public health nurse and a hired um, contact tracer. 
there's um I think Greenfield has several working. But um, to this point, I don't know if anyone's using, I know the state had offered um, state contract tracers and I haven't been on any of the conference calls. Um, our public health nurse is doing that. But I'm not sure if anyone around here are using the state ones. In an ideal situation, the state should have a database where we could look, that MAVEN system should be open to everybody so that that Hadley case could just put in the contacts and a Sunderland one would pop up and we'd be able to just, it would pop over to our screen, so to speak, and we would know. It's not the way it works. It, it, this is new to Massachusetts. And um, you never want to think, oh, the next pandemic, <laughs> but this is an evolving situation and uh, we're learning. And uh, even the state's learning, even the infectious disease control and Massachusetts public health and our local public health are learning. We're finding our flaws in our systems. But um, did, did I explain the system, do you think, uh, the people who can see me? Yes, Tom. So, so Caitlin, one other thing on when they talk, we, we had a discussion about this yet the other on Monday evening or Monday, 9 a.m. Yeah. And one, one of the things also for contact tracing is that they're looking for someone that has been in contact for 15 minutes also. So, so if someone was just passing, just passing by someone that would not necessarily trigger a contact call. So when they're looking at their, their contact tracing, they're, they're, they're wanting to talk to people that have been physically talking or exposed to that person within that six foot distance for at least 15 minutes. That's one of the criteria also. Oh, I'm going to write that down. I, I, I didn't catch that in my interview, but that's one of, that's one of the things. Sense. But but the and and it and it's kind of important just just so everybody understands also, is that when when um what they're finding with Deerfield and Whiteley right now is that there there's been like three cases that were referred to as Deerfield because they're looking at zip codes the what the zip codes that people are giving and and if you are on state road in whiteley you share a zip code with deerfield the 01373 so there was actually three whiteley cases that we referred to deerfield and so deerfield would have to start the thing the the, the process and then have to stop and then it got transferred back over to to whiteley so there's confusion on where someone's zip code is because that helped defines. But one of the things that was suggested and people may may want to start doing it, and we're going to be sending out um, in our senior meals, is we're going to be putting in the senior meals a little reminder that people may want to keep um, a journal of who they came in contact with uh, or where they've gone for, you know, something so that they may forget, someone may forget or, or miss someone. But they're 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 starting to ask people to maintain a journal, to, to kind of uh, you know something that reminds them where they were and who they talked to also. So you you are absolutely right. Sometimes it's it's not perfect. Um, the other thing I see Chief Eric was on here also. There was also concerns about once a household comes off from um, dispatch, as uh, has been identified as a place where COVID was was have you could still have members in that family because not everyone is getting tested you could still have members of that family that may have covid now but haven't been clinically diagnosed with that and so the people going into the first responders going into those homes may not know that so we're that we've also asked the dispatch to extend that out a while more because there could be other people in that home as well. 
So there's still, there's still a lot of things. You're absolutely right. There's a lot of things that are being fine tuned as we go along. Yeah. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you. Do you want to add anything since you're, you're uh, part of this and then we'll reach out to EMD? Uh, no, I don't really have any, any new information to add. Uh, Kaylin covered a lot of it and uh, you know, the officers are still obviously available 24-7 uh, and if anyone does need us to uh, still contact us, we are still available and we're still on patrol. Hey, Ian. How did our PPE score go this week? Mm, there's actually bad news about that. Um, I got an email. Oh, just sorry to hear that. Uh, from Steve saying he's on a conference call with other chiefs right now. The Fire Chiefs Association of Massachusetts has advised that the new KN95 masks are being tested to ensure they meet the expected filtration standards. He advises not to use them until we get the results back, if at all possible, whenever that is. Hmm. So is that a third party testing agency or this agency taking that into its own hands? It seems like it's the Fire Chiefs Association taking it into their own hands. So, okay. Eric, <laughs> I don't know what you did with those masks, but put them somewhere where they can't be reached. And other than that, I don't really have an update unless there's other requests to be made of V for PPE through MEMA. Did they say why they think they might be counterfeit? They did not. They said they, um, they're being tested to ensure that they meet the expected filtration standards. Okay. So, set them aside for now. Okay. Hey. All right. Uh, Jeff, anything that you've heard from any of your conference work or call-ins or whatever it is we're calling these now when you listen to the state? Um, no, nothing. To, uh, specific, sorry. Nothing specific, specific about, about, the, about the masks. Um, just tracking the numbers statewide it looks like um the the number of new infections are leveling off a little bit it's probably too early to say that um we've reached the peak but you know statewide i think last week around this time it was 2200 on uh, the beginning of the week and then um yesterday and today was I think you know under a thousand yesterday and about 1500 today um, so hopefully like Caitlin I'll knock on wood <laughs> that's a trend that continues um, and, and there isn't a rebound um, but I think the governor announced today that uh, schools will be closed through the rest of the year uh, the academic year um, and so, you know, not necessarily Massachusetts specific, but there are other states and cities that are starting. I think this week, I heard Atlanta, Georgia is opening up like hair salons. So um, just keeping an eye on those communities that are starting to uh, ease the restrictions and um, hopefully they'll all be okay. I don't have any indication that we're really doing that here in Massachusetts, but um, it seems like elsewhere in the country, they are sort of looking to what's next and, and how to uh, move beyond the immediate emergency. Okay. All right. Any other comments with regard to emergency updates uh, specific to COVID? If not, uh, we have our draft warrant articles in front of us, Jeff. We talked earlier about needing to add potentially two articles. Is that correct? Yes, potentially. So um, there is one related to mm. the uh, purchase of property for watershed protection. Um, and there was going to be some CPA funds and water district funds. 
uh, and I believe Conservation Commission was going to um, donate some funds. The good news is that uh, the state grant that's up to a 50% reimbursement um, was awarded. Uh, the other good news is that my understanding is that um, Kestrel will uh, front the money, so I don't think the town needs to necessarily borrow. Um, but the question remains, and, and I've asked town council to weigh in on whether or not town meeting, and, and maybe somebody here knows, needs to take action to authorize the water district um, to acquire land, or whether that as a separate entity from municipal government can do that without town meeting authorization? So, so I, I presented it to council, I just didn't know. Okay. And the second? Um, the second is uh, the regional housing authority is looking to create a temporary rental assistance fund related to COVID-19 and um, CPA funds can be used for that purpose. So the CPC was interested in potentially uh, including another warrant article and we've been trying to work with the Regional Housing Authority on getting information about the program, how it would work, um, and they're working diligently. Um, I don't know if if the board has a specific drop dead deadline for when they would want to do it. I said I, I hoped that they would have a, something for us by the end of this week, um, so that the CPC could take a look at it and and you all could look at it as well. Tom, David, what do you think about CPA for housing assistance? I mean, it, it's a, sort of a new use of it, but it definitely does fall under the umbrella of, um, of housing. And, you know, I think maybe we have to think about looking at some percentage of that for different reasons now these days. Might not be a bad thing to look at. If it's, if it's allowed, Scott, I think I, I, everything has to be done by a case by case basis. But, um, you know, as as far as Sunderland and housing right now, where I, I would I would see first thing I would ask is how how it plays to our uh, housing plan, you know, and if it's compliant with the housing plan, you know, probably it's OK. Um, but I, I just think we have to look at case by case. Okay, right. so Jeff, you'll get us uh, under homework, you'll get us some language or an article would look like both in scope scale and how it would be applied. Jeff? Uh, yes, yes, I will do that. <laughs> you, sorry. So Hollywood Squares, okay. And then, and then the, 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 the prior, the prior, the prior potential article, I guess it's important to bear in mind that the district ends up with the restrictions, but the town has to deal with the bridge funding. Is that am I understanding that correctly? Normally Kestrel would do a bridge funding and they're asking us to participate in that. So, uh at the last conversation we had with Kestrel on Friday, um, uh, Kristen was going to take it back to her board to ensure that they could do the bridge funding so that th the town would not need to. Okay. So, so we want to have as an article in the event that that's not possible, but bearing in mind that there's bridge funding from Kestrel and final funding from the state. Okay, Tom or David comments about, about those two being added to the annual town meeting warrant? No, it's fine, just go. Nope, sounds good. And reminder, our annual town meeting has been postponed to June 6th with our, I'm sorry, 5th with our annual election on June 6th. Okay. 
uh, motions will have as homework. And Jeff, if we can talk uh, next day or so about the revised calendar, right? We've got a calendar of meeting motions have to be completed X amount of days before, Warren article posted X amount of days before, we've moved those dates and now those dates being moved, uh, we'll wanna make sure that uh, we don't miss any of that uh, pre-work. Yep, absolutely. Okay, uh, select board updates. Um, we just had we just, um, a select board up. earlier earlier today. We just we had a uh, I had a meeting with the senior center director and the senior center board of oversight. And right now, um, we are we are in the process. We're doing we're going over 140 meals a week being uh, the drive through. Uh, we're still making our telephone calls. Um, so as far as that is. It's, it's pretty, pretty, uh, it, we're in a good place right now. And I would say if anybody needs anything, uh, any of the seniors out there need anything to call the senior center and we can, we will try to help either with delivery of, uh, meals or if they have any other questions. Um, and so they can always, uh, give the senior center a, a telephone call. Um, the other, the other thing is the last couple of days we've been, we've been having, there's been a number of meetings about um, the COVID-19 and 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 what's important and 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 how how we can get going. And we had a Frontier EDS, which is Sunderland Deerfield Whiteley Conway meeting the other day, and we talked about testing and um, how, how we how we could put that together and about. Uh, if if we have flu shots available, how we disperse those flu shots. So a lot of those things are in planning right now. But as I said before, um, we are we we, we will need we will need um, volunteers if we do, do any type of EDS. The uh, if we have so if you you know want and you could volunteer, especially medical people. Um, contact the town clerk or the selectman's office so that we can uh, discuss that. But those are things we're working at right now. And to reiterate the point, Tom, those are those are things that are in planning right now. Those are Nothing all concrete planning. yet. Those are all. Those are. <laughs> I will just state my personal opinion. Um, it just maybe from being on as a selectman for a number of years is the only people that you can depend upon are yourself. Um, and Sunderland, Deerfield, Whiteley, and Conway have, have, have done multiple EDS um, and, and we're really good at that. And we have great volunteers and I advocate for us to do more. Um, I'd love to see us do a, a, a testing clinic. And, and I, you know, you talk to like in Germany, if, if you have a problem in Germany, you stay at home, you call a number and a little little van pulls up to your house and they come in and they do the testing right there. Um, so I, I just think there's things that we can do on a, on a local bet level much better. And, and we don't argue about we don't argue about stuff like that. We just get it done. So I, I prefer just my I vote for us just to do this stuff ourselves. Um, and, and, and if we have to, we can. So, and, and I, I know, I know we, we'd get it done. So right now it's just preliminary. We're talking. Yes. Very good. EMD, you want to weigh in on that? What are your thoughts? I like what Tom said. Sunderland does have a history of getting it done. Um, if we could do a drive-in through clinic, I think that would be great. Excellent. Okay. Thanks, Tom. David, any updates? Uh, we had a personnel committee meeting um, last week, and then we're just going to kind of sit tight on our proposal right now and just see how things pan out. And then, you know, if we need to make adjustments, we can do that. Okay. Thanks, Dave. 
the village center committee meeting scheduled for Thursday. We'll be doing it in this fashion and uh, we'll give updates as to that. Jeff, we had uh, submitted through Representative Blay for visioning exercise and we'll see how that comes out. Um, and that's all that I have at this point. Um, Scott, can I add something, please? I, 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 I'd be remiss. Um, our state senator and state representative have been holding a number of uh, call-ins and, and informational where they're asking us. And, and I don't think uh, a day goes by where we don't hear from one or the other or their staff if there's things that we need. So I, I just like... I, I, I'd like people to know that that, that Natalie and um, Joe Comerford are they're they're working pretty hard at at finding and asking the right questions so that they talk to people in Boston. They're getting the necessary. Uh, they're getting they're they're making sure that the right people are hearing the right questions. And I and I think that so and and I also uh, Jim McGovern, our our congressman. He has very regular scheduled um, conference calls, Zooms, whatever they call them these days, that, that, that he's also asking, and he's asking for us to ask him the questions that, that he can relay to, to Washington. So um, th there, there's a lot of there, people in our, in above, us in the political whatever hierarchy, they're asking the question. So they're looking for answers coming from us down below also, from the locals. They're, they're looking for local answers or local questions or, or problems that are, are, are that we're seeing here on, on the ground. Thank you, Scott. Great point, Tom. And we've, we've participated collectively, uh, each of us over the last month in all Zooms and conferences and et cetera. And you're absolutely right. They're engaged and that's a very good thing. I thank the legislators at the state and then the federal level as well. Okay, on the select board updates, uh, you know the governor closed schools today. So I see Peter's backed and Keith is gone. Uh, we, we know we've gotten some guidance as well. And I guess the question that I'd like to have on the table is, at what point do we begin assessing the current school, all of them, Frontier, Franklin, and excuse me, Frontier, Franklin Tech, and Union 38, their current year budgets for areas that can be cut, including people who are not necessarily associated with education. And I'd like to have that on the discussion table, not necessarily for any kind of decisions, because that's not the way it rolls, but we have to begin understanding this year and next year. Uh, we can't necessarily get after next year's budget, but if we've got empty buildings right now or marginally used buildings right now, how do we save money in the current budget cycle? So there's Scott, a lot right. of people who aren't. Hey, Peter. Hey, Scott. Um, I know at the elementary school that almost from day one when the school, uh, they made the decision to close the school, um, they also put in a freeze on spending. Now, that doesn't, you know, they were, you could say, well, it's only small stuff because there was also the decision to keep paying your, um, all your staff because we're still running the school, even though it's not at the building. But there was a, a very specific uh, freeze put on for all spending that could be uh, determined not to be necessary. Okay, I don't have any numbers for you on that yet, but there are things like in the area of um, transportation. Um, I think there'll be a bunch of stuff with, you know, dealing with the custodial, not the, not the wages, but the custodial uh, expenses and stuff. Uh, I, I just know that that's being uh, looked at because both Darius and Shirley said, look, you know, who knows what we're going to be needing for next year and the more we can save this year, um, it's to our benefit. So, you know, I can get you some numbers uh, for your next meeting if, if that would interest you or um, pass on specific concerns. But I know that, uh, that, that what's going on there is what ought to be going on, which I think is what you're asking about. Yeah, Peter, I think that, that, captures, that captures my initial sentiment well. 
I'd also expand that at some point in the form of a question. It's, you know, mid-May, we have basically the last quarter of the year in front of us. And the question is, what, what if any labor savings are available for non-instructural, right? We know school requirements haven't been lifted with the exception of MCAS and schooling at home. But the question becomes, what if any other savings are there in the form of labor? So, and that we'll, we'll put, we'll, I'll ask the board and we'll see if we can get through a formal memo to each of the administrations that we work with you know, we, to look at those reductions in the current year. And I put that on the table for the board to discuss. And it's quiet out there. Good job. <laughs> No, I think we have to look at it and it makes sense because especially since we really don't know how uh, revenues are going to look. I mean, should I get a, should I try and get a report for you Tommy, for, for next week for, you know, giving you some, uh, some more specifics. I don't know for sure what's available in the way of numbers, but I can try and get you at least something that, you know, we could furnish you. Peter, since we we post since we've delayed town meeting to June, I don't think next week's important, but maybe a couple of weeks forward, so the administration can formulate and as they have, you know, thoughtful responses to these kinds of questions. I'd, I'd hate to have uh, artificial artificial date in there that, for the sake of doing the work, I'd rather have it thoughtfully thoughtfully worked out. Is is that something that it might be more? Um... Better way to run it would be that Jeff would just send a request over for, you know, what sort of uh, progress is being made to, to uh, cut spending wherever possible. That would be my feeling coming from the office. Yeah, I think that would be, Tom, you... I think that would be useful. I think that makes sense. Tom, any thoughts? Yeah, you know, Scott, I, I, I don't know. I, you know, I listened to, you know, and, and part of our conversation um, with Natalie and Joe the other day was some, someone asked about the, the governor. The governor had, there, there has been new, no new production or, 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 or anything has been put out there about what, um, numbers are going to look going to look like next year. Although you know, people are talking, people in the know are talking about um, four to six billion dollars less in the budget. Well, the budget's only what 32, 32 billion, 28 billion, something like that. So four, six, eight billion dollars less is is a significant amount of money. I, I have no idea, and, and I, I have no idea what, you know, our, our I'm, Peter, I'm sorry, I, that three to 5% that we asked for, that, that, may be, that may be the rosiest number that we're going to see. Oh, so I agree. I agree. I don't know what to do. I, I really don't know. And, and, and you know, that, that is the, the one thing, you know, they're talking about, I, I, I think, Scott, and Peter, maybe you've heard the same thing. We better start looking at one twelfth budgets. You know, and we're go we're, we should be planning on going one month by one month right now because I have no idea what's going to happen. And and you know, is the governor going to tell us May fourth we're going to start bringing people back on the soft start? I don't think so. Um, so that means people are going to be out of work for for a, a longer period of time. Um, in I I don't know, Scott. I I'm just very concerned right now. <laughs> So with well, respect to concerned. the, there's lots to be concerned about is uh, the question about the current year and Peter put that answer forward and I, I think our correspondence has got to be not so much focused on 21, but on our current year. Right. If there are areas that can be reduced in the current year, and it sounds like to Peter's response that that's been out there, you know, what kind of orders of magnitude are we talking about? The schools bottled up effectively. Transportation, as Peter pointed out, is, is, is rightly so directly affected. 
we're still continuing on with education, but we're doing it and it, it's being done in a very different way. Different ways have costs also. So it would be nice to know um, how we can continue to partner in that. That's yeah, the reason okay. I bring the point. Oh, I think it's a real good question. And I think that, you know, if you all could just send a memo over and maybe we could, I mean, I think that's something that enough time's gone on now, there ought to be a sense of exactly what it is that we're able to, to save by a freeze and, and what we can't. And, you know, that ought to be, you know, that ought to be talked about. Great point. So, um, Peter, we'll work with uh, Jeff, and uh, we'll actually, with that, with that said, can I entertain a motion of the board to send a memo to both Franklin Tech, Union 38, and Frontier to ask about current year spending, the plans for current year spending? And we'll leave it at that, because we're still developing budgets for 21, and that's really kind of a wild unknown to Tom's point about possibly going forth even in monthly spending. But the remainder of the year, again, we're, we're in April right now. The only other thing that I just wanted to mention was that in the latest uh, thing that seems to be coming out of Washington, where they've added who knows how many more hundreds of billions of dollars in spending, um, the one thing that got left out that was uh, any sort of package for local and state governments, um, but that also seems like that may be in the next round and just, you know, something, who knows what Massachusetts would get and who knows how it would be distributed and might not be much. Um, and, you know, I certainly agree with Tom. It's like, you can look at some pretty dismal situations here, but that's something that might generate some funds for the state a little bit down the road. Oh, so, so Scott, if I could, Peter, can, when, when you uh, talk to Darius, can, can you ask him, what percentage of the school's budget is labor? Um, and, and, and because, you know, Scott, and, and I, I think it's important, we have to talk, we have to talk about that because you're affecting people and, 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 and you can shut the, you can shut the lights off at the school. You can put the thermostats down to 50 degrees. You can, you can not pay the bus people. And I don't know how they don't get paid because they're going to lose their buses because they're, 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 and, and you can, so, so, and, but I, I, I probably would guess, and Peter, you probably have a better idea than I do on this one, but probably your non labor is like 30% of your budget. You probably labor is close to 70% of the budget. Good. Yeah, I was, I was going to get, I was going to get mm -hmm. 70 to 80 actually. So, yep. so when you look at that, Scott, I mean, they, and, and so you're already six, you know, six months through the, through the current, that current school year. I don't see, you know, you can say you can cut, but you're, you're, you're talking, I, I think you're talking tens of thousands and we're looking for hundreds of two hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah. I think, I think Tom, you're, you, you've got that correct, but the obvious thing to do is to, you know, I think it's certainly time now to ask and just get a sense of, of, of what's, what's going on. Yeah, and I think with that, Peter, I think with that, and I think that's a, a, a conversation we have to have with, with, our, with our people, you know, and, and the towns have to, the residents have to understand that, you know, and, and, and I think if we have an idea about, and we can, we can actually put faces to those numbers, right now they're numbers, but we, it, I think you have to put faces to those numbers as well. Right. Great point, Peter, as well as uh, Tom, as well as Peter. Yeah. So we'll we'll get that. Yeah. We'll get we'll get a draft, get a draft out through our office asking those questions. Jeff, can we work on that tomorrow? I'm sorry, tomorrow afternoon, late afternoon. Yes. Yeah, and I'll send. Thank you. I mean, I'll do, do my usual thing. I'll send I'll send uh, Darius and and Shelley a you know a note tonight saying, hey, this is coming, and so can you get something together for us and just you know, give it a little more push. So, cause I think this is absolutely worth doing. Absolutely. Great. Did yep. you, do you want a motion from a strict, from a, you know, parliamentary standpoint? Please. The motion yep. just to um, send the correspondence, motion. both to. Here. 
Second. Motions made and second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. It, uh, on okay. that topic, you, Jeff. can I, is, is there any interest from the select board of, um, I know right before I started, I think there was um, a four towns select board meeting and you know, I'm, I'm sure the other towns are asking the same question. Is there, is there worth have, uh, seeing if there's interest in having uh, a joint meeting where the superintendent can come and, and this can be discussed in addition to the memo? Sure. I like that yeah. idea, Jeff. Not a bit. Couldn't hurt at all. So, Peter, from your perspective, if I could ask, and Jeff, I appreciate the offer. Uh, and I think it makes a great deal of sense. Peter, from your perspective, what kind of timeline would it make? Because you're in a, everybody in education, everything right now is in a state of flux. Folks in education are doing not just yeomans, but laudable work to try to adapt to something mid-cycle. And I'd hate to be a disruptor in that, but we also have a responsibility to the totality of the town to understand, you know, wow, are we going to finish the year out? And what, if anything, does the future year possibly look like? So without heaping an extra load of work on the administration, what's a good timeline for a meeting? A couple of weeks, three weeks, a month? Oh, I think I would be pushing it to be sooner rather than later. And, and, and I'll send them, like I said, I'll send them a note tonight and just saying, hey, you know, I mean, sort of ask, you know, how soon can you put this together? And I realize that they got lots to do, but, you know, they're smart over there. And I think that they can, I don't think this will be a big burden because I know it's something that they're keeping track of because it was right out there from the beginning is we're freezing stuff. So I, I, I'm sure they're keeping track of it. And it's just a matter of putting together a little, uh, uh, you know, information page. Okay. So I would say so we'll, we'll push it, push it for sooner because why not? Fair point, fair point. So Jeff, we'll, we'll follow up with the correspondence uh, with the remaining towns and see if there is a way we can coordinate you know, what the four town does. And again, we can't leave Franklin Tech out of this because you know, they are, uh, although we pay the, you know, the, our, our cost of attendance, they're also a regional player in education. That's a big deal up there. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Peter. I really appreciate that. Can we move on to municipal aggregation plan and timeline? <clears throat> we have correspondence from Colonial. I listened in on the Conway piece and uh, on the Conway select board meeting, there were some concerns about some of the pricing that was set forward by Colonial uh, in their plan. And I'd like to make sure that our plan is what we actually started out that we're not getting, uh, we're not deviating from our original request. Jeff, what do you think? Well, um, I am not clear what the original request was. <laughs> I was not here. Um, so probability, a little bit of energy mix, uh, competitive uh, with respect to uh, Eversource's pricing uh, and it looks like we're being proposed for a 13 town split plan. Um, what should we, what should we make of it, Aaron? Well, they, they have not given us any pricing uh, for any type of renewable energy other than whatever source already offers. So the numbers that has been, have been quoted so far are for the amount that meets the RPS, the renewable portfolio standard. They have yet to acquire any type of pricing that gives us a range of options in terms of the degree to which the energy we would um, bid on would uh, have more renewable energy. So when they go out for what they call indicative pricing, that'll be in about uh, uh, several weeks time, we will get a range of optional products, 5% above the RPS, 25% um, above the RPS, 50% above the RPS, and 100% renewable. And then we can yep. see how those numbers compare to, be, to the Eversource basic rate, how much, where they stand. At that point, um, we will decide what 
what our default product is, the product we're offering the townspeople in Sunderland um, as a default unless they opt out. Um, but we don't have any of those numbers yet. And every source doesn't go out to bid until May. That was one of the things that was discussed at the conference call. Um, Colonial, looking at the prices that are that are there now in the marketplace, saying, "Wow, we've never seen prices this low," because oddly enough, of the pandemic being suppressing the economy and natural gas prices are greatly depressed, and electricity prices pretty much track uh, evenly with natural gas prices. So he wanted to act as soon as possible, and the, the folks on the conference call with Colonial said, well, wait a second, um, uh, we respect your instincts, but we really need hard numbers to look at. We need to know how these rates compare with Eversource and what, what the distance is between the two. So we pushed it a little bit um, back till, till May. Uh, prices are probably not gonna change very much at that point. Uh, and then at that point, we can make a more informed decision. The only thing that they're asking the select board to decide upon right now is whether or not Sunderland wants to go in together with these 12 other towns as a group and whether um, they approve this schedule. Part of the schedule um, contains a, a split bid and they explain why this would be advantageous. Rather than going for a 12 year, sorry, 12 month or 36 month contract, they want to split it into two pieces because the summer rates are typically lower than the winter rates. And so if we were to go for a, say a year contract now, we would get some type of blend between the summer and winter rates. But if we split it into two pieces, bidding now just say from August to December, we would get advantageous prices because of that low summer rate. And then we'd bid a second time in January for a longer term. That would give uh, the initial aggregation pricing, um, we, would, we would get a much better price to start out with, make it more attractive for, for Sunderland residents and businesses. So what I'm hearing, Aaron, is the split rate, obviously the first year, we're still built around a 36 month window in total. Well, that, that's up for grabs. We have not made a decision, nor has Colonial given us any guidance because they don't have the prices yet. What the term of the contract will be will depend on whatever sources price is and what we get in return from, from our request for proposals. At that point, we can make a more informed decision about what the best term of contract would be. It's good Jeff's right now doing the final stages of his procurement training, so we can be certain. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go from energy straight to waste, waste sludge disposal, Jeff, and you'll be all procured out. Yeah. Tom, any thoughts on uh, the current uh, status? And do we, are we interested in joining 12 of the communities to make it a full 13, which to Conway's point, there was, there was a lot of focus on that and uh, they voted to agree to do this. They voted to what, Scott? To agree to join 13, to, to create 13 well, towns. I, 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 would, I would say Aaron, Aaron's gonna be pretty, I think that's Aaron smiling. Yeah. You're smiling, aren't you, Aaron? Well, we yeah. had an <laughs> energy committee meeting this morning and um, uh, we uh, voted to make a recommendation to the select board to uh, join in with the 12 other towns because that gives us the best economies of scale, the larger the group, the better prices we get. And also to agree to, agree to this timeline to get us the best starting rate, as well as um, taking advantage of the current market prices. Um, we all, in addition to the default product, we are also able to offer what's called an opt-in product, uh, a greener product usually, and we, would recommend to the select board that the opt-in product uh, carry as much renewable energy as possible up to 100%. That's an opt-in product. Nobody who doesn't want it doesn't have to take it. In other words, they have to specify that product if they want it. And historically, Colonial has informed us that in most towns they've worked with, very, very few people actually go for the opt-in product. So why not make it as, as green as we can make it? 
That's okay. Because, because uh, I, I would say, Scott, if I could, is, is that, I, so, and again, I think we should put the pricing up there because if people actually saw the pricing, they, they would be going, where do I sign up for this right now? Right. Um, right. You know, you, when you're, you're looking at, you know, um, and, and again, it's, it's, it can be all over the place, but the, there's winter pricing and summer pricing, but summer pricing is typically less like Aaron was saying, and it's almost 10 cents. It's what current is like 99, so almost 10 cents. Okay. And, and you can, and winter pricing can be like at 13 cents. And, and we're talking about, you get six months, 12 months, 18 months, for like 0 0.091. So there, there could be some considerable savings to the, com, you know, to the consumer from these prices. So I, I would agree. I, I would make a motion that, well, I would, my opinion is, is that we should, we should uh, continue the process. I would agree. And, and joining with the other 12 towns, I mean, the whole point of it is to get as much bulk so you can get as good a price. And that's kind of why we're doing this whole thing. So. In the report that I sent to you a couple of weeks ago, um, after the conference call we had with Colonial, we asked them in their best judgment, what type of prices are we likely to get if, when we go out to bid in May? And their estimate, again, this is not anything you can put in the bank, but they suggested that if we do that split pricing scheme that I just talked about, that um, for the 13 towns together, we get a price somewhere in the mid to high 808 range, so 08 something, and um, Eversource's rates would probably be somewhere in the 09 range. So they anticipate an, um, you know, a, a definite savings from the, from the point of view of the multi-town uh, plan. And then, of course, as I said before, we'd get a range of different products with different amounts of renewable energy in there, and then we can make an evaluation once we know what every source's rate is, exactly how much we can add. Uh, one of the other things I talked to Denise Allard about and was my concern is, of course, every source is going to make uh, use of the depressed market rates as well. So my question was, well, how much green energy are we going to be able to add without going over Eversource's rate? Because Eversource's rates are going to be pretty low as well, we would guess. So this remains to be seen, uh, how much uh, green energy we can add over and above the RPS and still um, be lower than Eversource. It's not clear what that, that margin is. I appreciate that point, Aaron. That's something that the board raised was about price and stability as well as the type of portfolio. And those, those areas, there's always a tension in those areas. In particular, when you're splitting a year up and doing, as someone who owns property in another state that does a split year, winters are very expensive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the market is so volatile right now. Nobody knows what the future is going to look like. Um, you know, eventually you the market really will, will adjust okay. from its current depressed state. No one knows how fast or how much. Um, it may be that a longer contract will be in our best interest. I mean, that's certainly one of the things we would be asking Colonial. Um, of course, they, they don't have a crystal ball over there either, so it's going to be hard for them to know. This is an unprecedented, unprecedented situation for everyone. But um, their instinct was to take advantage of these low prices and, and get the best deal that we can. Perfect. As long as they didn't buy oil futures to be delivered yesterday, we can trust them. <laughs> no. Very good. So, Tom, was that in the form of a motion to accept the Energy Committee's recommendation and pursue us forward? Motion. Second. Motion's made and seconded. All those in favor of pursuing the energy aggregation with our 12 member community and a timeline is presented signify by saying aye. 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 Thanks Aaron, I appreciate that. Okay, okay. next meeting. April 27, 2020. Seems so close to what would normally have been town meeting, but you know, that's a whole different story. Uh, everybody out there 
uh, pay attention to the mass.gov sites, listen to the real news, and uh, take care of yourselves. Any comments from the board? Uh, no. Not hearing? I'm good. Motion to adjourn. Motion. Second. The motion made and seconded. All in favor of adjourning? Aye. Aye. Okay, call us out at 7.36. And thank you, everybody, for participating. Stay safe out there.